You're listening to Inside the War Room, Case Studies in Crisis. Join us as we explore true stories and reveal new insights with our guests, key figures in some of the largest and most complex events of our time. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our podcast, Inside the War Room, Case Studies in Crisis, where we'll speak with and endeavor to learn from figures who have successfully led their organizations through crises. Inside the War Room is a new podcast. It's co-produced by global communications firm Burson Cohen and Wolf and business intelligence and investigations firm Kroll. I'm Sharina Boddy, and I'm joined by my co-host, Michael Estevez from BCW and Jordan Strauss from Kroll. So the question is, why did we decide to create a podcast about leadership and decision-making in crisis? Maybe because our collective experience at BCW and Kroll and guiding clients through all manner of sensitive engagements has really taught us that it's not if a crisis is going to happen, but when. So it got me thinking, I want everyone who's listening to just imagine a crisis you've experienced. Think of the moments immediately before, the calm before the storm, if you will. Now I want you to try and recall the immediate aftermath. Close your eyes, think back to the smells, the sights, the thoughts, the confusion, that moment of shock. And then I want you to remember as the shock begins to dissipate and you start to try and comprehend what's actually happening. You begin to process Now I want you to imagine, and maybe this is true for you, but if it's not, I want you to imagine that you're a leader in some sort of capacity, whether it's over a business, a governmental entity, your family. You're now leading in this tragedy. You don't have the luxury of remaining in stasis. Everyone's looking to you to lead, to make decisions provide information, bring some form of stability to the chaos. How are you gonna make those decisions? Where are you getting your information from? Do you have a plan to implement? If so, do you know how to implement it? Who are you gonna rely on to vet the information that's coming in? We all know that during a crisis, it's chaos. You're either overwhelmed with information or it's a complete vacuum and you have no idea what's going on. In either instance, you need to be able to gather and vet information that you can provide and make decisions upon because people are relying upon you. Not only do you need to make those decisions, you need to be able to message them. So how are you gonna communicate with your people? How are you gonna ensure that everyone knows what to do, where to go, who to listen to, what to believe. These are the moments of truth that make people in leadership positions leaders. It's not the position that makes you a leader. It's your ability to lead in times of crisis. One of the things that we really wanted to do with this podcast is invite some of the amazing guests that we call friends. Each week, people who have held key positions during some of the world's most notable crises. We want to learn from them. We want to take you inside their war room, so to speak. Hear their stories. Hear about the initial shock. Hear about how the plan maybe wasn't able to be implemented the way we had quote unquote planned it. We want to hear about how they transitioned from shock to action. The information that drove their decisions. The ways they learned to message. How they brought stability to chaos. We want to gather their insights, not just so we can hear interesting stories, but our goal here is to help people learn to lead in times of their next crisis. We want to give you tools that you can use to prepare, because again, it's not if, it's when. We want to make sure that we can gather the lessons learned throughout all of our guests' crises, that they don't go to waste. And we want to use them to help you, our listeners, become better leaders. During this introductory episode, we wanted to let you behind the scenes on some of the major crises we've personally dealt with. Jordan, you had a key role in leading the Justice Department's response to the Fukushima tragedy in 2011. 
Can you tell us a little more about that? Just to be totally clear, I was lucky to have the opportunity to be one of the Justice Department lawyers who worked on a really large interagency task force. Uh, and because of the role I had at Justice, I you know, went to all the meetings, did all the briefings, set in on all of the calls. Uh, but it was very much a, an incredible team that handled that. I, I remember the incident quite well because it happened around one of my birthdays. And uh, ever since I started working, I've always taken the day of my birthday off to sort of like hike or get outside and just reflect and think about the last year and the next year. And the night before, I'd gone out with a few friends to celebrate and stayed up just way past curfew. And I'd given myself the birthday gift of sleeping in an extra hour. So I think I woke up at 6.30 or 7 instead of whatever time I usually, uh, I, I, I usually wake up at. And uh, as I do now, you know, back then, the habit was first thing before you get out of bed, check emails, check your phone. And normally I'd wake up and there'd be 10 or 15 emails, just like overnight op center updates, things like that. And that morning there was like one or 200, which is, which is a lot for four before 7 a.m. And a bunch of missed calls, which you just, you never, you never ever want to see. So, you know, bottom line, um, it had become apparent that um, something had gone really seriously, potentially wrong with the nuclear reactor complex in Fukushima. And the interagency had been tracking seismic activity and these really severe weather events for the, the prior week. But this was when things started to get a, a, little, a little out of control. So uh, I was asked to handle some of the senior level conferences. Um, so I, I raced into work. And when you do this sort of interagency conference, even though as nothing on the actual on this actual call was classified, we had to do it over the special video conferencing system. And what that means is you, you, you trudge up a bunch of flights of steps. I, I, for whatever reason, didn't like elevators back then. And then you walk into this beautiful command center in the old historic Justice Department building, and you go down this you know, mahogany-lined hallway, and then you take a, a very hard turn into a very austere space. And then you open this enormous metal door uh, and you step into a place that feels like it's it's a room on stilts suspended inside of an aquarium. Uh, I'm making it out to seem a lot more like a, uh, a, a a James Bond layer than it probably is. I mean, remember this was built with you know federal construction budget, not uh, uh, not Hollywood budget. But it, it, it's a weird space, and the air is a little bit different in there. And then you get kind of sealed in, and you seat yourself in front of this huge wall of screens and the wall of screens populates and in each little box there's a, a lead from um, another department or agency and you know as it happened almost everybody on this first call knew each other because we had and i'll talk about this in a moment uh we all worked in the response space and we'd in fact uh, just a couple months earlier by happenstance done a big joint interagency exercise on uh, uh involving uh, a hypothetical nuclear meltdown somewhere in the United States. So I remember the first meeting and it was, you know, this, this is happening. Information is really spare right now. We're, we're trying to get a better sense of what's going on. The, the host country government is trying to get a better sense of, of what's going on. And we really need to stand up um, a battle rhythm for interagency meetings and set up interagency task forces. And, you know, the, the rest is sort of history. I mean, I don't think that it was known at the time, but it, it's, it's now widely accepted that the events there were probably the worst non-hostile nuclear radioactive incident in history. I, I can't remember whether it was as bad as Chernobyl or, or worse than Chernobyl, but it was really, really bad. And I remember that next couple of weeks being just a fire hose of information. And one of my jobs at Justice at the time was making sure that all of our teams, so you know, the leadership offices uh, and the various divisions um, working closely with the command center were all playing off the same sheet of music, that everybody knew what everybody else was doing. Because when you have an incident that balloons, that involves security affairs uh, that could potentially affect United States citizens and interests, and we have at any given time 
like 100,000 soldiers and independent families in Japan. We have a ton of diplomats over there, right? Every single agency was affected, uh, some more than others. I mean, DOD had an enormous number of troops and, and troops' families over there. And one thing that DOD does is, is make sure that its people are, are safe. Um, I remember, you know, as a side note, it was really interesting to see how different agencies who had who were differently invested in terms of their personnel on 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 station reacted. So there was all of this information coming in, and DOJ, I assume now, but certainly at the time, was a highly professional organization, um, really full of of, of of very smart lawyers and, and non lawyer professionals who really just wanted to do the right thing and, and help out. And we were confronted with this kind of complicated task at DOJ of helping to support interagency legal work, trying to pre-identify the kinds of legal problems that could arise. For example, if shipping cargo got um, got irradiated. I remember there was, there was one morning where it was just like things were just really going downhill. I mean, there was like volcanic activity and it created these like plumes that would make flying jets through them difficult. And there were like aftershocks and... I think that the um, reactor complex wasn't venting hydrogen correctly, and when you have a nuclear meltdown and it, you know, generates a ton of hydrogen, and hydrogen is extremely explosive, so you know the hydrogen can start exploding, which can further damage the reactor and and you know drain um, cooling pools. I mean, it's just it's just absolute nightmare. And at the time, the there were a lot of questions about the quality of information that was being produced by. A number of different sources and how the United States government should be dealing with the relative absence of quality given its diplomatic obligations, its obligations to its own people, its obligations to its citizens, et cetera. And I remember at the end of this call, somebody, I just, I don't remember who it was, said, you know, just, just everyone, just so you know, you know, there's, 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 there's a huge shark population in the waters around Japan, you know, we're, we're very concerned about irradiated sharks because sharks, I guess, can travel really far. And I, I just remember leaving and being like, oh, my, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> like, uh, I, I just I never thought that like radioactive super sharks would be something I would have to put in an email that might end up in front of like the attorney general. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was it was it was crazy, but it was also it was a, a very beautiful kind of crazy. And what was really remarkable about it is, I mean, in addition to the fact that all of these people, most of these people had done this big interagency exercise a few months earlier. So we kind of all knew each other and we knew who to go to. And there's a saying in in the space that when you need a friend, it's too late to make one. So every, everybody was was already friends. And just seeing how much that helped facilitate operations. Um, you know, the senior official from DOJ was a, a assistant attorney general for environmental and natural resources. Uh, Ignacio Marino is an extraordinary lawyer. And she had been one of our players in this this big interagency exercise. So she just knew everyone in the national security complex, which made it just so much easier for her to act. But, you know, the White House set up this incredible structure for crisis management. And I mean, that included things as simple as a set battle rhythm for interagency briefings, but also, you know, shifts of people who were running things, expectations for when um, when information needed to come in and would be actioned on. Um, a lot of thought was given to communications. I do remember my my best friend's wife, who's a brilliant university professor, called me maybe a week or two into this and said, they live out west, and, and said, uh, you know, just, just wondering, I'm seeing on the internet that there's a huge radiation cloud moving across the Pacific Ocean. Do we have anything to be worried about? And I sort of thought, oh, my, oh my gosh, you know, like we, <laughs> uh, you know, we really need to make sure we're, we're, we're communicating more clearly um, and more carefully. And then just watching the decision processes that were, were were laid out for decisions on things like use and sharing of strategic national stockpile assets, you know, how to manage potential uh, runs on like potassium, potassium iodide, which you can take to reduce the risk of thyroid cancer uh, in radiation events. Just the, the container... And the information sharing and the authorities were, by dint of the national security system, very clear. And there was this normal conflict resolution process and the, the national security system, the conflict resolution process is resolve everything you can. Uh, if, if there are unresolved issues, get it to the assistant secretaries. If the assistant secretaries can't resolve it, get it to the deputy secretaries. If they can't resolve it, get it to the secretaries. If the secretaries can't, can't resolve it, 
it's going to be a decision by the president. And, you know, I, I can't really talk about some of the issues here, but there were matters that needed to be escalated very high up, it, mostly involving departments and agencies that had different uh, different needs and different sensitivities given their operational tempo and the folks they needed to, to talk with. It was a, a remarkable experience, and I didn't get any sleep for a period of weeks, but just watching something like that play out over time and observing the need to be dynamic when you have very real information asymmetries and limited resources to do it, even when you've got the United States government and the Japanese government who have this, you know, we've got the military, we've got FEMA, we've got the energy department, um, HHS, all of these organizations that can throw bodies at responses. So that was, that was a pretty remarkable experience for me, uh, definitely a, a memorable one. Jordan, that's so interesting. Do you have any sort of um, words of advice or takeaways that maybe our listeners could you know, use from your experience to help them in whatever crisis they may be managing themselves through? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I think I touched on it a little bit, but having that crisis container and knowing how, crisis is, how a crisis is going to flow, you're never going to be able to anticipate everything. Um, I mean, I, you know, for us, it was the radioactive super sharks and risks to the fishery population. Um, you know, maybe right now it's the scale uh, of this pandemic. I suppose that's up for argument. But if you've got a clean container, a clean venue and framework for resolution of issues, intake of information and action on information, and then also, you know, marrying it with really carefully constructed messaging, you know, messaging for different constituencies uh, and messaging what you know and what you don't know and if what you know might change. That was critical. And then again, it is just the craziest thing that, that this, this specific group that was doing this response happened to do an exercise, I think, six months earlier involving a lot of the same facts. Uh, I mean, it's, you, know, you, you can't make this stuff up, but the, when you do things like that, when you exercise together, uh, it reduces so much of the transaction cost uh, of getting yourself organized. And there's always a fog after crisis, right? I mean, there's always an, a lack of information. I mean, this happened the Boston Marathon bombing. This happened here. Happened during the pandemic, 9-11. Every single time, you know, you're going to get ratty data for the first couple of days. Um, but if you know who you're supposed to be dealing with, and you really have a relationship with your counterparties uh, or your leaders, it's really helpful. And you know, you can never reduce the fog, but you can you can you can try to mitigate it. And one of the ways that you mitigate it is is by doing things like exercises and thinking ahead. And I just I, I can't think of a cleaner example than that from from my time in government of why planning and preparing is a good idea. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thanks, Shereen. So we're really lucky to have as a co-host Michael Estevez. Michael is an expert at a lot of things, but he's especially good at crisis communications. And he and I have worked on a lot of cases over the last couple of years, and I've learned an awful lot from him and about the importance of the communications element of a crisis. So Michael, would you, would you tell us a little about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's great to be here and great to be with, with you both on this podcast. Um, so I'm Michael Estevis. I'm with BCW, and I'm an executive vice president and managing director in the firm's public affairs and crisis practice. I'm a lawyer by training, but I have spent my entire 20-plus year career in communications. And my job is basically to help leaders communicate effectively during a crisis. And so that can include communicating with journalists and managing social media. Uh, it also can help, uh, can also include helping a CEO prepare to address his employees after a significant crisis event. And so my work has spanned everything from advising a corporate board chair on how to inform a CEO he's unexpectedly being fired to organizing a press conference for journalists around the world uh, from 80 different countries. Um, you know, my job has also taken me to an oil rig platform in the Gulf of Mexico. And so along the way, you know, I've learned many important things. 
the most important is you have to do the right things in order to say the right things. And so my job oftentimes has more to do with collaborating with senior business leaders as they formulate their operational response and help them think through how their decisions and actions are likely going to be viewed by their stakeholders, in addition to helping them develop and execute their crisis communication strategy. So Michael, is there, um, is there a specific like event or incident in your life that you, that you remember that caused you to be, become really focused on, on, on crisis or become really interested in it? Uh, well, I've been doing this for, as I mentioned, for more than 20 years, um, and I've been through many situations and learned a lot of lessons, but I think 9-11-2001 stands out given the personal impact and it's just its place in history. And, you know, what's really strange about it is that the communications lessons I learned that day didn't really materialize or occur to me until many, many years later. And as I mentioned, I've done this uh, for, for a long time. Uh, I've been through many situations and learned a lot of lessons, but I have to say that 9-11 stands out because of just the place in history, but also just the personal impact. Um, you know, but the interesting thing is that the communications lessons I learned that day didn't really materialize or, you know, come into being until many years down the road. Michael, what were you doing on 9-11? Well, at the time I was living in Hoboken, New Jersey, uh, which is a small city across the Hudson River from New York. And depending on how old you are, you either know Hoboken as the birthplace of Frank Sinatra, or that's where Carlo's Bakery is located from Cake Boss. Um, it's a small city, about a square mile. And at the time, I was the spokesman for the mayor of Hoboken. And so we had just won the municipal election in May, and we were sworn in July. And so as of September, we were barely in office about two and a half months. And I also had just started law school at night that semester. And on that particular day, you know, instead of walking to work like I normally would, I drove um, because I had to go to class immediately after that night. And so as I parked in front of City Hall, there was a small crowd of about 10 or 15 people standing outside, which was immediately unusual. And so I stepped out of my car and there was the public safety director at the time. His first name was Angelo. And everyone was looking up. And from that vantage point, you could see the north face of the North Tower and you could see black smoke billowing out from it. And I said, hey, Ange, uh, you know, it seems like a pretty bad fire at the Trade Center. And he said a plane hit it. And then Angelo said it was a jet plane. And I immediately thought that's impossible because that would just knock the top of the building right off, not realizing just how massive those buildings were. And then he said, a jet plane hit the other one too. And then I was just confused because it just, I, I just could not process or comprehend the notion that two jet planes would each hit the towers individually. And so when we, we walked inside City Hall, Angelo and a few other people, we were taking the elevator up to the third floor where the mayor's office was. And I just remember saying, that can't possibly be an accident. And that was what the conversation centered around in the elevator. Just how could this accidentally happen? And that was the first takeaway that I, that I got from that day. Um, and that is just a notion of cognitive dissonance at the onset of a crisis. I think you see it sometimes with mass shootings or other crisis events where people immediately freeze. And it's not necessarily, I don't think, because of fear in all cases, but it's just that people cannot comprehend that what's actually unfolding in the moment is actually happening. And so one of the things that I say to organizations with which I work is the, the hardest thing is to recognize a crisis because you can't simulate it. Even when you do a crisis simulation, you know you're there for a simulation. But that ability to recognize a crisis in real time and be able to respond is something that's very, very hard. People with law enforcement training can do it, you know, military training, maybe maybe others. Uh, but it's 
it's a very difficult thing to comprehend in the moment. And that's one of the key things to be able to recognize that you're in a crisis and be able to respond immediately. And so after that, we, we step out of the elevator um, and there were several people who were gathered around my desk, including the Office of Emergency Management Director, who's the, for Hoboken, who was the interagency lead. So he coordinated amongst police, fire, EMS. Uh, he himself was a police officer in Hoboken. And also there was our city finance director, whose husband was the mayor of the next city over. And at the time, they had these mobile phones that had this push-to-talk feature. So you could just speak to someone as if it were a walkie-talkie, and they'd immediately hear your voice. So as we're gathered around my desk, we're all buzzing with activity. I, I can't clearly remember exactly what we're doing, but I clearly and vividly remember the finance director's husband, the mayor of the next town over, shout over her phone, the Pentagon just got hit. And I instantly say out loud, we're under attack. And I just began to imagine every landmark building in every major city across America was going to be attacked that day. And I just remember thinking to myself, this is only the beginning. And I began to almost break down a little bit. I, I felt this welling up of emotion. You know, when I heard the OEM director say, I just feel like, I just feel like crying. And it was at that moment that something clicked. I just realized that, you know what, we were all going through this and we had a job to do, every one of us. And so we had to buckle down. And so that was the other takeaway that I got from that day. And that is for CEOs and people who are leading their teams through crisis, your team is struggling with emotions just like you are. And it is a choice to be calm. And it is a terrible burden to bear when you are leading a team through crisis, but it's one that has to be done. Um, in terms of key lessons learned in terms of crisis communications and things that, uh, that I've taken away and impart on clients on a regular basis, uh, was something that occurred to me in the days after. So in the days after 9-11, we would hold daily briefings in the mayor's office with police, fire, EMS, and the Office of Emergency Management Director. And in those briefings were also the civilians, myself, Mayor's Chief of Staff, the heads of the various departments. And at each briefing, the OEM director would give a download from all of the briefings they received from outside agencies. So New York City first responders, New Jersey State, uh, there's a train station in Hoboken, so New Jersey Transit uh, was a key stakeholder, and also, of course, the Port Authority. And so my job was to collate all of the information and discern what needed to be disseminated out to the public. And the day after 9-11, one of the key things that we were briefed on is uh, watching out for the walking wounded. So people who you know, might have been injured, maybe in shock, but still mobile, making their way possibly into the path train uh, or the, you know, the subway train between New York City and New Jersey, making their way into Hoboken and just being watchful and ensuring that those people receive rapid medical treatment. The day after that, uh, during the briefing, they told us that there were no walking wounded injuries found. And I remember speaking up in that meeting and saying, you know, we need to be honest about what's happened. But we also need to be optimistic. Um, and that was really the final takeaway that, that I took from, from that day. And it was just a moment. Uh, it was a very visceral moment because I was the youngest person by far at the table. But I was the one that kind of snapped up and said, hey, you know, we need to, to snap out of this. And, you know, this is, a, this is a difficult thing, but we need to maintain a sense of optimism. And so the takeaway is that, you know, leading through a crisis is more than just doing what needs to be done in the moment. And the worse the situation is, the more important it becomes to provide people hope and encouragement and to stand up and to say, we're going to get through this, follow me. And so those are some of the things that I learned uh, 
from my experience uh, on that. Shireen, you spent 10 years with the FBI, and before that, you did humanitarian relief work overseas. Tell us more about you. All right. Well, um, as you all know, I currently work for Kroll. I'm an associate managing director in their Los Angeles office, and I run what's called our business intelligence and investigations practice. I only came to Kroll a little less than a year ago. Prior to that, I was with the FBI um, as a special agent for just over 10 years. Um, I worked countless cases in my career, but primarily focused on financial crimes and public corruption, which can be very interesting, but you're not going to hear those stories. Um, most notably, and, and if you all want to Google, the only thing that will probably pop up is that I was the case agent for the Paul Manafort investigation and trial um, under the special counsel's office. So that was my probably most notable case that I had. Prior to being in the FBI and something that actually drove me to work for the Bureau, I'd spent a number of years, most of my 20s actually, overseas working for a variety of non-governmental organizations, doing a variety of types of relief um, in countries all over the world. Most of the time I spent in Turkey. Um, and prior to that, I was a wannabe beach volleyball player. I wanted to be in the Olympics and and Funny enough, I actually was pretty good. You know, I wasn't great, but I was pretty good. And my very first partner was Jen Kessie, who ended up winning a silver medal in the Olympics. So, I mean, that's kind of like going to the Olympics, right? And I know that when you were quite young, you actually responded to a major crisis in Turkey. Tell us about that. I did. I did. So I was young. I was maybe, maybe 22. Um, and I was working for an organization that was headquartered in Eastern Europe. Um, we had been doing some long-term development and relief uh, in the Bosnia and Croatian area post-war. And um, while I was there, so doing this other work, there was a, a large earthquake that happened in Turkey, um, just east of Istanbul. It was actually a 7.6 magnitude, so a really large earthquake that happened in a fairly populated area um, just east of the city. Interestingly enough, if you look at official reporting, they say the death toll was around 17,000, but I can tell you the actual numbers were, were far higher. Um, more notably, more than a quarter of a million people were left homeless overnight, living in tent cities eventually, but completely displaced. And it happened in uh, mid to late August. So winter was sort of on the horizon. Um, winter in that part of Turkey can be pretty brutal, a lot of snow, very cold. So we knew um, that was something that we, we really wanted to and needed to go help with. And since we were very close in proximity at the time, it was in Bosnia when it happened, um, we, we weren't very far away. So the organization I worked for decided to, to go and assist. And we went back to Prague, which was where our headquarters were, and gathered a semi-truck full of immediate and midterm relief supplies. And we began the drive to Istanbul. Along the way, we encountered some uh, some difficulties, if you will, <laughs> um, first with the drive. So even in 1999, the drive from Prague to Istanbul probably shouldn't take more than a day, especially if you're driving the whole time. Um, it took us three, <laughs> mostly because our quote-unquote police escorts um, repeatedly demanded bribes to continue escorting us through the countries. Um, especially in Bulgaria and Romania. So our, our trip ended up taking three times as long as it should have. Thankfully, we did not have any perishable items in, in the truck. Um, but to make matters worse, when we finally arrived in Istanbul, we found ourselves woefully unprepared to navigate the chaos and, and frankly, very corrupt and decentralized uh, lack of organization. I mean, I was 22. I was naive. I was idealistic. I mean, yes, I had been working in a war-torn area, but I was still a girl from Southern California who very much had these ideals of like fairness and equity and, and whatnot. And um, I thought some reason that we were going to be open, you know, welcome with open armed, open arms, and, uh, and that all of our supplies would be doled out fairly and equitably to those who needed it most. Uh, these beliefs were quickly shattered when the entire cache of supplies we brought were stolen by the local, well, I'll call them gatekeepers to protect the guilty here. I was outraged. I'm partially in disbelief. 
I mean, I remember complaining angrily and in English, which isn't super effective when you're in a foreign country, um, to those that were in charge. I, I remember screaming about how unfair it was and how wrong it was. And as you can imagine, my tactic was not successful. So we had a choice. We were, could not, literally could not bust down the door that we needed to get through. Um, so we had to either turn away or figure out another way inside. I was not prepared to lead in this type of, of crisis. I mean, you have the crisis of the earthquake and the people who are in dire need. And now you have the crisis that you came to help and everything you have has been taken from you. Thankfully, the person that was in charge of my group had much more wisdom and tact than I did. He realized that if we're going to be able to provide assistance, we really needed an advocate that understood the local waters, someone who knew how to navigate cultural, national, linguistic, and other barriers. This was my first lesson. Rather than break down the door, why not just be a plus one to someone who's been invited inside? So we resupplied and we returned to Turkey. We lost about a week of time which I remember thinking was tragic for those who desperately needed our help. However, this time our advocate ensured we, our travels were shakedown free. And upon arrival, we were actually able to bring our goods directly to the tent cities where tens of thousands of displaced Turks were living at the time. I'll, I'll never forget arriving at the tent city we ended up staying in. As far as you could see, there were just these makeshift tents that had been set up by UNICEF. And there were masses of people everywhere with, you know, very much that glazed over look in their eyes of disbelief and, and lack of understanding of how they were going to get through the next days, weeks, months, years. Almost everyone I talked to had lost a family member. Many of the people I talked to had lost the breadwinner of the family. And even in cases where, you know, the breadwinner maybe was still alive and able, businesses had been destroyed. And the entire infrastructure was uprooted. The pictures I have are, I look at them today and they're almost unbelievable, the destruction that was caused by the earthquake. So when we got to the tent city, you know, we had, we had navigated Istanbul, we had navigated Bulgaria and Romania. You know, we were on a winning streak at this point. But when we got there, we had a new gatekeeper to contend with, uh, the gendarme. And, and for those who maybe aren't familiar, essentially that's sort of a, a governing force, pseudo-military, pseudo-police that generally governs over rural areas. Well, they'd been tasked with securing the tent cities. Having learned from our previous experience in Istanbul, we quickly identified the key stakeholders and began creating allies. People that could lobby on our behalf to ensure that our now newly created supply depot tent would remain secure and that we would be able to have unrestricted movement so that we could actually give goods to the people that needed them without fear that they were gonna be taken by the authorities. If you'll remember sort of when we, we began at the outset, I touched on kind of two factors that are really important in decision-making. And, and I think those have stuck with me since this time. Really learning how to message properly and how to accurately gather information that you can rely upon for decision-making. I mean, ideally, you're, you're going to have some sort of plan in place to implement when a crisis starts. But when we were there, we had no plan. I mean, we had gone there on a whim. We had had lots of troubles along the way. And when we finally arrived, we didn't really know what the heck we were doing. I mean, we were literally making it up as we went. We had to establish some means of communicating with people who, by the way, did not speak English. Um, and the leaders, who we were, where we were, how we could help how we could get to them, who needed our help, how do we prioritize? There's literally a quarter of a million people displaced. We had to establish a means of gathering accurate information about a, a situation when all the infrastructure had been destroyed. People were displaced, governance was decentralized. I mean, it was utter chaos. These challenges really taught us the overwhelming value of having allies. I think that my biggest lesson that I, that I learned thankfully at a very young age, was that you need people you can count on to help get your message out and who, you can, help, who can help you gather the right information with both expediency and accuracy. But it's really hard to find these allies in the middle of a crisis. You, you don't have the time. You don't have the means. 
you may not have the ability to, to literally get from one point to another physically to find these allies. And so my biggest advice to anyone who's leading in any capacity, build your network of allies before the crisis hits. Know who you can turn to, who you can call, and establish those relationships before the crisis happens. So when that moment occurs, and you know we talked about sort of the moment where the cloud, kind of the dust settles and the cloud passes by and, and, and you start to process and react, you know who to call. I mean, in the end, I spent a winter in a tent city in Turkey providing aid directly to people. It wasn't perfect. It was good. And you know what? Sometimes good's good enough. So I'd say my second piece of advice would just be during a crisis and when you're responding, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. You're probably not going to get to perfect. And sometimes good's good enough. You've been listening to Inside the War Room, Case Studies in Crisis. Inside the War Room is produced by global communications firm BCW and global investigations firm Kroll, a division of Duff and Phelps. For more information about this episode and to learn more about how you can work with BCW and Kroll to prepare, respond, and recover from a crisis affecting your organization, visit our website at itwrpodcast.com.